Welcome back everyone, I'm Kevin, volunteering with C++ now this time, and I'm sitting here with Bill Hoffman, uh, the inventor of CMake, I, I think might be a good way to put it, at least at the start. Bill, say hello, hello. tell us about yourself. <laughs> Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Bill Hoffman, and uh, I'm one of the uh, founders here at Kitware Incorporated, and we started the company around a thing called the Visualization Toolkit, which is a C++ library for doing scientific visualization software. Um, it was in, came around in 1994 and we made a go of a company to support it. Um, this was back sort of when open source was new, C++ was new, and we had this exciting uh, you know, adventure with open source. And one of our first contracts was with the National Library of Medicine to help them create a medical segmentation and registration toolkit in C++ because they liked what they we'd done with BTK. So we were part of a team, three commercial companies and three academics to create this open source tool um, for segmentation and registration again in C++. And we were one of the engineering teams and we were just tasked with making it build on Mac, Windows, and Unix back then, it was mostly SunOS um, yeah. back in the early 2000s. And I had been sort of that GE, I'd done a lot of build stuff with AutoConf and then Windows was starting to show up. So cross-platform was starting to be a thing. And you, the way people did it is they had an AutoConf file for Unix and then they checked in the Visual Studio project file into their source code version control system, which was an absolute nightmare, as you can tell. Um, BTK had something called PC Maker, and it was a tool that wrote out NMake files. Um, yep, I remember NMake. And so uh, we had this project with the National Library of Medicine, and we were sort of tasked with making a build. I'm like, I'm going to write a build system that is cross-platform. And the whole goal was just really to make it easier to use C++ across platforms. One of the goals of this project was to provide a research tool for researchers. So you have grad students want to use this big library, which ended up being you know a million lines of C++ code. And without having easy to use build tools, it was really hard if you wanted to make it work on your system. Like you could right. build it, but then if you had a small project that wanted to use this large project, getting all the include flags and linker flags and all that stuff right was nearly impossible for a grad student, right? And that's where CMA came from. Um, very pragmatic tool just to, uh, to get us past this engineering problem of creating a tool that could be used by anyone regardless of experience with, with build tools. You know, I remember I remember actually writing make files by hand, and so I definitely find CMake to be easier when compared to make files. And I haven't used a lot of other build systems outside, you know, the one that was built into Visual Studio. Um, but I will say it is kind of telling the things people have made CMake do. Um, you know, and and some of it's kind of funny. Like Matus uh, had a lightning talk where he had his CMake end up building all of his slides, and he manages slide builds with CMake. What's one of the funniest <laughs> things you've seen somebody do with CMake that maybe not what you originally thought it was going to be? Well, that's actually the the easiest one, and it was it's a bit of a joke, but uh, someone actually wrote a ray tracer in the CMake language. <laughs> <laughs> And uh -huh. did like a, a, re a rendering of the, the beach ball on the uh, <laughs> on like the scene. So that that's the most ridiculous thing I've seen with CMake. <laughs> that's funny. So C++ now. Um, I know you talked last year and you're giving a talk this year, but when was your, what was, what's your experience been with C++ now? Yeah, so uh, I went to one, I don't even remember when, I mean, it was, probably in the early, in the 2000s, maybe 2008, 2006, and it was BoostCon. Yeah. Uh, and I made, met David Abrahams. Um, and I remember he gave this really great talk about um, explaining what Boost was for, right? He had, uh, like, he showed Java and he says, here's like this huge list of 
components that come with Java, right? There's a right. date thing, and a this thing, yeah. and a that thing. There's hundreds of components, and here's Python, and here's all the stuff that comes with this. And for C++, we've got IO stream, <laughs> <laughs> which was basically the standard library back then. Right. Um, and he's like, Booth is trying to fix this problem. And I remember watching that talk and thinking, well, you know, you talk about those other languages and CMake aimed to fix the build problem. Right. Right. We wanted to build, we couldn't build once and run everywhere, but we needed to be able to build everywhere the same. But right. we also wanted to be able to take advantage of tools like Visual Studio and IDEs. And, you know, if you like Emacs or if you like Vim, we want to, you know, basically take advantage of the developer. Um, right. So I went to uh, BoostCon and to pitch CMake and, and to really try to sell it to the C++ community. And it probably fell a little bit, uh, a little, a little bit of a thud. And I, you know, uh, you know, they, they like their BJM with Boost and, you know, there were, there's definitely holes you could poke in CMake and, and certainly CMake back then was pretty crappy. I'll have to admit, um, but it did the work, you know, it was sort of an engineering yeah. thing. And it, it's gotten a lot better and, you know, things, things have changed. You know, there's modern CMake now, which is more of a target oriented, almost object oriented way of looking at the build. Whereas back then it was more like a stream of consciousness, kind of like, almost like a make file um, that had subdirectories, you know, bleeding down the flags, just like you wouldn't a make file. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's come a long way since then. And obviously we've grown in market share and, and importance. Um, to the community. And I think it's, and really with C++ modules coming out, um, I felt it was important to become more involved with the C++ standards committee and the, and the people working on that so that they can understand the issues that build systems face um, and, and that we can work together to, to forward, you know, advance the language um, in a way that works for everybody and all the tools involved. Um, so that, that's why I've been sort of jumping back in and really kind of uh, trying to take more, more part in the C++ community in general, um, given CMake's large um, footprint in the community. Yeah, it's, I mean, that's excellent too, because, you know, I remember seeing at some of the CPP cons, like there's been a few other build tools that have come out, but generally speaking, you know, from size and I don't know if ubiquity is the right word, but for implementation and where it's being used, you know, CMake is just, it feels like you got 80% when it comes, especially to the C++ projects, if not more of market share. I mean, your, your install and use space has got to be large, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's an open source project. So again, it's, it's hard to tell. True. Um, but I think Jeff Rains does a survey and we're over 50% of all C++ projects is what they're showing it keeps growing each year it's 50 to 60 percent but yeah well no and so i guess the thing i was looking at it's like you know i like i know amir and several people from incredibuild and i just happened to read an article this morning because i was brushing up on some things and even incredibuild is just you know listing out how great cmake is compared to some of these other projects and i was like oh that, that's kind of telling coming from a commercial company <laughs> so so I was reading about your talk for import CMake, which you're giving this year. And, you know, as I was reading through the synopsis online, one of the things you were talking about in it, if I understand correctly, is kind of the problem with modules from a, a chicken. It sounds to me like a chicken and egg thing. You, you need a compiled portion before you can actually have CMake do an import. Am I, I'm, I'm probably describing that very wrong, but you can correct me with what I was going through there. <laughs> Sure, it is a bit of a chicken and the egg problem because suddenly now um, C++ has an order in which things have to be compiled um, because you can't import a module until that module has been compiled and there's a module file to import. Um, so how do you find out? So essentially you have to look at all your source files and find out who produces modules and who consumes them. Mm -hmm. But the best way to do that is with a C++ parser and who's got the best C++ parser, your, your compiler. Right. So you have to compile the code before you can compile the code. And you can <laughs> say it's a problem there. Yeah. So, <laughs> so 
So we worked with the, the compiler vendors and added a scanning phase um, and a, a format for representing that um, who provides and who consumes mm -hmm. in a standard format. And Microsoft has come out with it in Visual Studio, um, which is integrated with CMake. Yep. And um, Clang, we've got, um, has uh, upstream that, so the latest copy of Clang. And we've got a patch for GCC and are working hard on, I guess it's got a few, uh, few tests are failing. Something happened with the Unicode um, in the build. I'm not sure exactly the details, but we're, we're working on it. Um, so that, that should be coming soon, but we really needed help from the compilers because, yeah. Um, and, and interestingly enough, C++ actually has a long history with modules, just not C++ ones, Fortran ones. Oh, um, okay. And the way we solve that is we have a really cheesy Fortran parser inside CMake, but you can't really get away with a, a bad C++ parser. There's all kinds of trouble that would cause um, of getting things wrong. So you really need the compiler to help you out here. So it's it's been quite an adventure because we have to essentially get the compilers to have the support before the build system can build with these this new uh, feature in C++. In, uh, C++. So it's a very long path it's been. <laughs> so, you know, one last question. I'm curious, what are you most looking forward to this year at C++ now? I think just getting together with everybody in person um, and hearing the issues they're having with uh, CMake and modules and, you know, really just hearing about the community and, and what the what the problems are. I mean, you really, you get a lot when you when you get together face to face with people and find out real problems and real issues. And, you know, I'm hoping to make new friends and, mm -hmm. and meet someone, you know, so it's. Yeah, I do like that part. We're just such a small, small group. However, this year will be, will be different because we got almost double from what we had last year. So that's going to be interesting to see. That's great. I mean, last year was definitely uh, just coming out of the pandemic and the little, uh, I think we all collectively had pandemic uh, PTSD. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but I think things are uh, coming down now and, and people are more comfortable with uh, in-person gatherings and, and, and seeing people again. And, and I think we're, you know, I think as a community, I think we probably suffered a bit from a uh, lack of communication and face-to-face, -face, um, you know, collaboration. So I think I'm excited to, uh, to see that pick up and see more new faces and to hear from, uh, from other new people. Yeah. It's, you know, we, I'm with a company, the company I'm with, we definitely ended up doing the everyone's move to working from home, which, which I enjoy. I've worked from home for a lot of years, but you know, I do miss occasionally being able to just turn around and look at my buddy next to me and say, Hey, can you look at this piece of code? Cause I know I got something wrong and, and just having them look at it versus trying to do a screen share over Slack and, you know, pull someone in. It's just, I, there are the, you know, I do like having my flexibility to go to lunch whenever I want and you know, all these kind of fun things, but there are definitely the parts where getting together and just being next to another human makes sense. Definitely agree. I'm looking forward to seeing you in person. Yes, yes, we will have to we will have to get together and, and do another dinner. And so, um, but listen, I want to thank you for your time today. I mean, we've only got a few more days before we end up meeting together. And so uh, I look forward to seeing you there at the conference. You as well. See you soon. Thank you. Thanks.